hello everyone welcome to motorship propulsion and future fuels live webinar on wind assisted propulsion held in association with the international windship association my name is gavin all right secretary general of iwsa and um, firstly i'd like to thank uh the webinar sponsor skv zephyr group thank you very much for your your kind support of this webinar now, before we launch into everything, I just have a few housekeeping issues. Um, uh, with the public, oh, sorry. Uh, available to use throughout the session, which we welcome delegates to use uh, to make introductions and comments, etc. Please do not use the chat function for asking questions. Now, there is a private chat function as well. If you have any issues or comments for the host, uh, please use the private section of the chat, which allows you to send private messages to specific people. Admins for the session uh, will be listed there as well. Uh, the Q&A, we will give the opportunity for delegates to ask questions to the panel at the end of the session. This feature is found next to the chat function. Uh, so please type any questions here throughout the event and the moderator will read those at the end. If you are directing questions, provide the speaker's name uh, in the question. Um, just a couple more, mobile phone or tablet. If you're using a mobile or tablet, please note that the chat function may be hidden and can be accessed by clicking the blue speech bubble icon. And finally, the recording of this session will be sent to all attendees after this. So uh, once again, welcome to uh, the Wind Propulsion uh, Seminar. If I could have my uh, slide up, please, Markel. So this is just a, a, a sort of holding slide, just to give you a very quick helicopter view of what we're talking about. As as everybody knows, you know we're we're in a period in the industry and alternative energy sources yeah you know, they are really the key to decarbonizing shipping of course wind propulsion wind assist and primary wind propulsion is rising up in the in the agenda or in the um, uh, uh, consideration for credible viable energy sources and today we're going to be hearing from a number of technology providers projects and experts in this field um, who will be telling you you know or, or uh, opening the door into the possibilities that wind propulsion actually delivers and as you'll see from the usps here you know the direct the use of direct wind energy you know, we're talking about a zero emissions energy source that's abundant it's free to uh, uh, the user at the point of delivery, doesn't require new infrastructure, doesn't require um, energy storage on board the vessel, for example. Can wind propulsion do the whole job, all of the heavy lifting? Of course not, not across the whole fleet. However, it can provide a significant amount of energy to each vessel and broadly across the fleet, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and this isn't a future energy source. This is an energy source that's being harnessed already today. You're using modern, automated, certified, safe systems. Um, there are actually seven different types of wind propulsion technology. Four or five of those are breaking into the market or, or pre-market right now. We have rotor sails, which we'll be hearing uh, more about today. We have suction wings, which are a, a ventilated rigid sail. Of course, we have rigid sails, wing sails, uh, the soft traditional sail systems. And also we have kites, which again, we'll be hearing a very interesting presentation about today. And there are some uh, turbine uh, developments and also hull form developments where the actual hull of the vessel is used as a wing itself. Now, these can be retrofitted um, or in new builds. Now at retrofit, we're looking at uh, probably around five to 20% can be delivered with the existing technologies. Those will likely be optimized up to 30%, but we're putting those on vessels which are not optimized for wind. Once you move into the new build, 
aspects, then you know those numbers can get quite exciting as well. So we're going to be hearing uh, about a project a little bit later, uh, exactly around that use of primary wind as well. Now, very quickly, how does this fit into the decarbonisation um, pattern? Well, if you take a fuel-centric approach, we've got a lot of heavy lifting to do with alternative fuels, which are probably a decade or more out from um, being uh, available around the world. When we take a propulsion-centric view and we incorporate wind propulsion into that view, then the challenges start to start to fall away. You know, we're delivering 20, 30 percent across the fleet solely from wind. Um, then you bring in some vessel optimization, um, some operational changes, maybe speed, maybe weather routing, and then we start to get well over the 50 percent mark. Um, making that alternative fuel nut a lot easier to crack. Um, what is the current situation? Well, we actually have, um, even, even this slide is out of date, we actually have 13 current installations of wind assist on large vessels, uh, a, a, another 20 plus on smaller vessels. And the forecast out is that we will likely double that over the next 12 months and double again over the following 12 months without any commercial contract signed in the meantime. So it's highly likely to be higher than that. The EU forecast uh, around about 10, 000, up to 10,700 installations by 2030. The UK Clean Maritime Plan has taken that out to 2050, looking at a, a fleet penetration of between 40 to 45%. In IWSA, we feel those numbers are Um, and, you know, if we take a high ambition approach here and really look at wind as being a facilitator, the funds, the, the fuel savings that wind could generate over the next three decades actually could provide the funds for us to reach uh, the IMO 2050 projections um, and possibly further of actually paying for that decarbonisation in total. But that's the high ambition look, and I'm hoping that we will take that high road. But without further ado, um, I hope I've managed to frame what we're going to be talking about today, what you'll be hearing today. Um, it's now my great pleasure to hand over to our moderator, uh, Lars Robert Pedersen, the Deputy Secretary General of BIMCO, and I think we're in very safe hands there. So Robert, please take it away. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you for a very nice introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to all our audience. I understand there are a great many people here today um, to uh, to listen into this uh, interesting session. Um, what we're going to do is to to listen to uh, some experts. Uh, we have. Uh, classification society, we have uh, some uh, technology providers, uh, we also have a ship owner who will give us a, a view from the end user uh, point. Um, and uh, without further ado, I will uh, skip directly to uh, our first presentation, uh, which is uh, by uh, Aude, uh, LeBlanc, uh, who is the technology leader for sustainable shipping at Bureau Veritas uh, Group. Uh, Aude LeBlanc have been working in, in, in this uh, field of uh, uh, marine business for, for a, a long time and, and uh, uh, recently been uh, involved uh, very much in, in developing rules for wind assisted propulsion. Um, uh, and there uh, is really clearly an expert in the field. She holds a master engineer degree in mechanical engineering. And uh, Ord, uh, please come to the screen and uh, give us a, a quick intro to uh, the the field of wind assisted propulsion. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very delighted to present our new release of uh, rules about uh, wind propulsion system and uh, two. Oh, 06. So Bureau of Veritas is a classification society and uh, wind propulsion with uh, Bureau of Veritas is a long story. Um, in 1986, we BV class the very first uh, tanker with uh, wind assisted propulsions. And in 1987, we published the first dedicated not 
for wind propulsion uh, plants, NR206. And now, at the beginning of this year, we published a new release of this knot, um, which is the current rules for the wind propulsion. And it in introduces additional classification notations, uh, wind propulsion system uh, one for standing rigging and wind propulsion uh, two for standing and running rigging. So this new uh, rule knot help to support and drive the development of zero carbon uh, propulsion options for model ships. It uh, um, introduces a different level of approval to support the development of the technology. Uh, at Preliminary stage, we propose an approval in principle, and after, for the detailed design, design approval may be performed. And for production in theory of the wind propulsion system, type approval of the system can be performed. And when the, the ship is prepared and uh, the ship uh, is installed with a wind propulsion uh, systems. Classification notations uh, uh, may be granted to the ship. So we propose two different classification notations. The first one, WPS1 for the standing part of the wind propulsion system. And the second one, it's WPS2 uh, for the standing and the running part of the wind propulsion system. And this Notations are assigned with a construction mark in order to follow the construction of the wind propulsion system itself. So these new rule nodes provide requirements for all type of wind propulsion systems. It includes the traditional and modern rig, of course, but also freestanding rig, it's a rotating rig or not, and also the wing sails, the kite rig, rotor sail or suction wings, for example. And we also include different means technology, uh, telescopic technology or tilting technology. And we cover different type of material, steel, aluminum, and composites. The rules cover the different type of area for the requirements. They include the different life state of the project, um, the design approval, and the survey and testing, including the, the construction of the wind propulsion system and also the in-service uh, inspection. We consider a requirement for the wind propulsion system itself and also when the impact of the wind propulsion system on ships. So the main the main domain uh, is um, for the wind propulsion system. It's the material, the different load cases, def definitions with extreme conditions and normal conditions. It means when the, the wind propulsion are, is in service. Um, it includes the structural design, the foundation design of the wind propulsion system, the lightning protection also. We look also um, at the drive unit with the winch or hydraulic systems, the automation systems to manipulate the wind propulsion system. Uh, we look also the safety really system, if any. And uh, considering the impact of the wind propulsion system of, uh, on the ship, uh, the key, atta key attention points are the ship stability with the influence of the wind propulsion system in two different configurations, the electrical installations and the machinery to be in adequation with the wind propulsion system uh, loading, uh, modifications also of rudder and steering gear or steering gear due to the overload of the, um, this part. Um, another point is the mooring, uh, the mooring equipment, which should be adapted with the, uh, the, the installation of the wind propulsion systems. And of course, uh, modifications of the earth structure of the ship, 
the reinforcement of the of the earth structure or um, modification for the for the the implantation of the wind propulsion systems. Another key point is the arrangement of the wind propulsion system on board the ship, uh, in particular with the visibility on the bridge and uh, arrangement in um, relation to the hazardous area, if any, and uh, fire safety uh, on board the ship due to the fact that uh, the wind propulsion system is installed on board. Um, <coughs> Key, key points also include the survey uh, at the construction stage and also see trials and final testing and in-service inspections. All these key points are to be addressed for verification of the wind propulsion system. So the general requirements are given uh, by different documentations. So we require generally and particularly for innovative system, for innovative technology, a risk analysis report, which should include all the critical conditions, such as if you can have accidental cases um, with uh, particular design load cases to be, um, to be checked, and all the, wind, the impact of the wind propulsion system on the ship safety um, the control and automatization, stability, hazardous area, etc. And uh, the oper we need to have an operating manual which includes all the limitations, design limitations, such as the maximum wind speed um, in relation to the configuration of the wind propulsion systems. And of course, we need to have the different material and equipment certificates, product certificates, uh, which can be delivered for each equipment. And of course, all the calculation notes and drawings, which should include the definition of automatization and release systems, all the determinations of loads, um, and the different configuration of the wind propulsion systems with the loads applying in, in, depending on the wind conditions are to be uh, defined by the designer and inertia loads are to be also included in and uh, taking into, into account the different sh ship motions and um, finite calculations are performed by finite element model in considering a non-linear calculation approach. And which we, the key points, another key points, it's a ship strength modification with a modification due to different load on all girder or local reinforcements and all stability calculations and of course general arrangement and all the drawing for the scantling as needed as classical needed. So these all documents are checked in accordance with the, the notes, which uh, include the different requirements, safety requirements, and minimum conditions to be considered for the, for the wind propulsion system. And of course, um, the wind propulsion uh, in, induce reduction of emissions of the ship and it should it could be taken into account during the calculations of the EEDI, the Energy Efficiency Design Index, as um, defined by IMO guidance. And so verifications uh, is done at a design stage and verified at C trial stage. And during the design stage uh, the EEDI technical file should include different um, parameters for the wind, for the consideration of the wind propulsion system. So it should outline the wind propulsion system, uh, should define the calculation process, uh, which includes the wind force matrix and the probability matrix. But this part um, of 
calculation process are are now in need further development uh, to clarify how we can uh, define the wind force matrix and the wind probability matrix. So there is also there is a need of uh, further development for, for this uh, for this part. And the verification uh, at C trial stage. Uh, are now not very defined. So, because uh, ships is in calm sea state, if we consider the ISO for sea trials, so you are no wind propulsion is active, and so question is how we can consider the wind propulsion and verify the performance of the wind propulsion during sea trials. If we need additional powering test with wind propulsion. And what can we consider as a wind direction or wind speed? And what is the duration of navigation to be uh, considered? So there is, at this stage, we, we need further development for classifications. And so and this work is in progress. And several papers are, have been submitted for the next um, IMO MEPC. To clarify this uh, EDI cal EDI calculation for ship with uh, wind propulsion, so this um, on walls uh, we have a good base of uh, of walls for the wind propulsion um, system, but there still need a further development for clarify uh, different uh, different points such as verification of the performance and also. Uh, different statutory for that. So, thank you for your uh, attention. So, thank you, Ort, for taking us through these uh, very important uh, basics uh, uh, about rules and and how we we actually establish uh, what a wind propulsion system can actually deliver to the ship. One thing is to deliver in service reductions, but also we want, uh, of course, to capitalize this on the EDI calculation. And this is uh, work in progress, uh, and and that's good to 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 know that that it's about to to be fixed, so to speak, because it's it's a missing link. Um, we have to skip further on to, to our next speaker, uh, which is uh, one of the technology providers uh, from uh, Norse Power. Uh, it is uh, the COO, uh, Jarko Weinema, um, who will uh, explain a bit uh, about his systems. Jarko has been uh, working for 10 years in, in, in this business and and, uh, and he's very experienced in, in, in clean tech. Uh, so Jarko, please uh, take us through. Thank you. Thank you. So Jarko Vainam, as, as said, and head of head of operations and technology in, in North Power. I'll explain a bit about North Power and our products and, uh, uh, and so on in the, in the following. Um, we are the, the, the first company to, to bring to the market, as we think, uh, a proven auxiliary wind propulsion system. And, um, and so far, we've installed the system into to four different types of vessels, uh, including rural tanker, ferry, and, and now a bulk carrier. Actually, we announced this last week, this uh, latest installation. And, and the first one, uh, the Roro Estraden, has been has been running since 2014, so uh, seven years now. Uh, this is a growing company. Last year we had a, had a 5 million euro turnover and, and we are aiming to reach 100 million turnover by, by 2025. Uh, we're based in Helsinki, Finland, uh, but we have also recently opened a, a, a company in, in, in China to, to, to provide the bonuses that they are local. Um, our staff is uh, more than 20 people, but, but we, of course, work in a network of, of uh, suppliers. So, so it's, there's a lot of other people involved in, in the delivery projects than, than us only. Um, what we are talking about with the rotor sale is, is just uh, 
uh, one way of, of, of modernizing the wind propulsion. So even though these are round cylinders, they, they, they are sails and act like sails. Their, their mission is to provide forward thrust for the, for the vessel. And um, uh, quite common mistake is to think that these are turbines creating electricity, but, but that's not the case. The savings depend on, 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 on the average wind conditions uh, in, in the area where the ship is uh, voyaging and, and, and also um, what kind of configuration has been made on, on board. More, more, more sail area there is, of course, more wind propulsion can be provided. Um, and and uh, depending on the wind conditions, we provide uh, um, and replace the, the service power with wind propulsion. This makes the system uh, a hybrid system. Whenever there is wind, we get the benefit from that. And, and if there's not, then the uh, ship, ship goes um, ahead by conventional means. Um, our technology is suited for, for almost all types of ships, um, maybe excluding container vessels where, where it's a bit difficult to get the uh, open deck area, what, what is needed. And um, we believe that the technology is compatible with all other types of uh, fuel saving methods available. And, um, there also needs to be a business case to, to make it worthwhile, not only, only saving the planet. And, and the typical payback periods ranges from three to nine years, uh, commonly. We provide the rotor sails in, in different sizes. Um, we currently have uh, five sizes available. Uh, with also a bit different aspect ratios. And um, you can see the list of uh, different sizes here, but basically the larger the ship, the larger sail should be, should be used to, to get more benefit. Um, the rotor itself, it's uh, the rotating component, it's uh, made of composites to, to make it uh, sufficiently lightweight and, and uh, to have the fatigue endurance uh, um, uh, properties the best possible and um, and otherwise the the structure is, is steel um, and um, the system works in a way that the with the with the fast rotational speed uh, we create a pressure differential and and uh, this way we we get a forward force which then pushes the ship along um, we need to take some electricity from the vessel's uh, um, uh, electrical grid, but we will give this um, energy back uh, with the use of wind uh, by, in average, by, by ten, to 10 times higher. And um, you can see also a, a, an illustration here about the, the tilting system, which is uh, currently offered also as an option for, for um, getting reduced air draft for making going under bridges and, and so on. Um, to highlight our most um, well not not the most recent reference but but the but, but, but the one before that is the C cargo SC connector installation where we have installed the largest rotor sales built ever. On a on a rural vessel, um, they are uh, 35 meters high, with uh, five meters of uh, diameter, and uh, already standing uh, roughly 20 meters above the water level. So so they reach very high, and and we get this way we get the maximum benefit from from the sales. And um, in in this uh, slide, there are some quotes from from the customer uh, regarding the uh, experiences we've had during the uh, few uh, last months. Um, for example, with the with the rotor sales, we have been able to 
generate a maximum force which is equivalent to, to 7 megawatts of uh, propeller shaft power actually uh, increasing the vessel speed by 7 knots at the, at the time. Um, they have also experienced that the, um, the rotor sails improve the sea keeping ability and, and uh, by reducing the roll and, and this way enabling higher higher speed in harsh weathers and, and they, they, this was sort of a surprise to us also. We, we knew that this uh, uh, phenomena exist, but we didn't uh, realize that it's, it's, it's so effective and, and of course we, we are happy with this function as well and, and we are de developing that further. Um, then uh, a short uh, intro to, to the EX, EEXI and, and, and carbon intensity indicator is that um, with the uh, forthcoming new regulation there is a possibility of, uh, of, uh, of the ship owners to, to get compliant with the, with the new regulation by, by um, introducing um, um, uh, sail power to the vessel and, and this uh, slide highlights it uh, it, it, it pretty well. And, and since we offer this unique plug and play retrofit possibility, you can, you can improve the asset sustainability and longevity. And, and the installation can be, can be done, done in port. Um, one more slide. North power is here to reduce environmental impact of shipping through the commercialization of innovative and modern sail power and that's that's what we do and and our vision is to set standard in bringing sails back to ocean transportation and empowering shipping towards reaching goal of zero carbon emissions i can see my time is running up so that's why i accelerated a bit in the in the end but Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jarko. Yeah, we, we are a bit uh, time pressed, and it's always nice to hear some uh, real life examples of, of wind powered ships who have actually been out there and, and have some, some real experience and some real uh, uh, results to share. Uh, we will quickly uh, skip to our uh, next presentation, which is also by a technology provider um, that is uh, ASEs, uh, a, a relatively uh, new uh, uh, company. Uh, ASCs will do the presentation uh, jointly online. Uh, it will be performed by Vincent uh, uh, Burnett, um, who is the, the CEO and co-founder of ASCs, uh, which is a, a setup uh, where uh, Airbus is also involved, I, I guess, to some extent. Um, and, and Vincent have been working in the field of uh, wind power or using wind for, you could say, lifting things uh, for a while he's also a pilot and uh, and a sailboat skipper so he knows a lot about these things um k-line part of the presentation will be done by uh, daisuke arai who is the managing executive officer of k-line um uh, responsible for the uh, advanced technology uh, section of k-line uh, with a fleet of over 400 uh, ships um so, uh, Vincent, please uh, take it away uh, and show us what you have. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Vincent Bernatetz. Uh, I'm here to present um, ASCs and Seawing. Uh, ASCs is a team of um, passionate people for sailing and flying. We actually come from the aeronautics industry uh, with a unique expertise in how to make a safe system fly. And uh, we gathered uh, a complementary team of people from Maritime in order to make that uh, technology and know-how applicable to uh, shipping. We are all determined uh, to contribute to decarbonization of, of shipping. And, uh, and for that, uh, our offer is uh, a kite system that is uh, able to pull a ship in order to uh, reduce uh, its power uh, requirement. And uh, really the key, the three key things to remember is that the kite is the most powerful system uh, to use wind. Why? Because uh, it's, it's flying dynamically. And uh, as such, it will, it will generate a, a much higher power, traction power, 
due to the fact that the, the power is a function of a square function of the speed. And by flying dynamically as an eight uh, trajectory, the kite accelerates uh, greatly, maybe twice, uh, two times or three times. And uh, as such, it multiplies the traction power by four or nine. In addition, it uses uh, altitude winds at about 200 meters above sea level. And as such, uh, the winds are, uh, are providing extra power. The second aspect is simplicity. Well, it's simple to use with a simple on-off switch button for the crew to operate. And also it's only two days to retrofit or to swap from one ship to another, which makes it very easy to implement for ship owners. And finally, it's available now because what we want is to help our customers to comply with their 230, 2030 objectives uh, in terms of um, carbon footprint reduction. And also, and to enable uh, future food fuels to come in. As uh, Gavin already said. So the company got created in, in 2016. And since then, we, we had a lot of time to, um, to develop and test at various sizes. And already from the spring, we started to, um, to operate and test at sea uh, 250 square meter kite system. Uh, in order to reach a 500 square meter kite system by end of this year, which is going to be the first commercial implementation on a build a bordeaux ship, which is a rural operated by Louis Dreyfus uh, on behalf of Airbus uh, between France and the United States. Uh, the next step will be next year, a very important one too, uh, with a 1,000 square meter kite uh, delivered to Kreline, and you will hear Later on, Mr. Arai uh, talk about this. Uh, really, the idea is to pave the way for uh, future fuels uh, and uh, to reduce the, um, the carbon uh, drastically uh, to make it safer, cheaper uh, for those fuels to be introduced uh, due to the fact that the ship will need less uh, power on board. But really, all this is uh, possible thanks to passionate people, but also uh, key innovative uh, ship owners. Uh, and we need those people to take the lead and introduce new technologies to, um, to trust uh, new players like us uh, with the know-how they have and they can bring to maritime instead of uh, simply maintaining the status quo uh, detected by incumbent established players. Uh, and as SEs, we're very, very lucky uh, to count among um, uh, with us uh, K-Line, uh, which is the fifth uh, fleet in the world. And uh, Mr. Arai, that I will introduce now, is the global executive officer for K-Line in charge of uh, container ships, but also digitalization, IT environment, and new technologies. So Mr. Arai, could you please, uh, Take the mic. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, this is Mr. Rai from K-Line in Tokyo. I think I look a little bit dark. It's nighttime now in Tokyo, so that's why. Uh, so uh, K-Line operates more than 450 ships around the world, covering all types of ships, almost all type. Uh, that includes passion, passenger ships, not only cargo ship. Uh, passenger ship is operated by a group company. So all in all, some 450 ships around the world that we operate. And we are very much looking forward to having sea wing flying on our ships in the very few, uh, in the very near future. Uh, it should be coming soon. Uh, we believe, as Vincent just explained, Sea Wing is a powerful enough to bring energy efficiency to our ships. Uh, and it's also very practical. And we think it suits our fleet very much. It is relatively light 
and easy to install. It doesn't kill that much cargo space, which is very important, as it's light. It also doesn't kill that much dead weight, which enables us to carry or maximize our car cargo. And uh, this is also important. It's, uh, it fits almost any kind of ship, and it doesn't interfere with any uh, loading or unloading equipments. Regardless of whether the equipment is on board or on shore, you know, it, it unfolds when you're not using it. So uh, the loading and unloading operation could be uh, run very smoothly. It doesn't have any interference. And importantly, uh, someone like Kline who cares for safety navigation, it, 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 it maintains good view from the deck. Uh, so that you know, uh, you know, there is no block in the, the view itself for safety navigation. So all in all, uh, we think uh, Sea Wing is a very good solution, not only for K Line, but uh, anyone running ships and wants to see uh, energy efficiency. So we can't wait to see it flying on our vessel, which should be soon. Thank you. That's all from me. Thank you, Mr. Arai. That was uh, very nice to hear some uh, some real life uh, uh, project here to to be installed. Um, we have our last speaker today, uh, which is uh, Roger Stravens, uh, a VP of uh, Global Sustainability uh, at the Vilnius Wilhelmsen Group. Um, Roger has been uh, around in this industry for quite a while and, and been uh, very much engaged in the maritime environmental policy areas and, and sustainability discussions. Um, he is uh, currently uh, uh, the VP, as I said, uh, of one of the uh, commercial divisions of Valinius uh, Wilhelmsen um, and, 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 and now responsible for environment uh, uh, in the group. So, uh, Roger, please uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Lars Robert, and uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, as the case may be. Um, just to begin with a little bit of context first, Millenius Wilmson is the deep sea vehicle carrier, um, uh, and we're operating a fleet of around 120 vessels. We own fully 80 of those vessels. We see that decarbonization is the biggest challenge of our generation. Um, but we also see that despite uh, the uncertainties and the unknowns that it represents, it's also, uh, we're confident there will still be shipping at the end of it all. So our approach to decarbonization is incredibly important to us. It's an opportunity. We take a very broad approach. Um, so we're trying a lot of different things. But for this presentation, I just want to talk about one of those major initiatives. Um, there's a giveaway on the, the slide here in front of you. It's our Orcel Wind. And the second thing I'll talk about is some of the thinking behind how we develop uh, the, the initiative. So if we could go straight to the next slide and I can give a quick introduction to the concept and where it is at the moment. So for the, the Orcel Wind, this is a, a, the same concept as the Ocean Bird, which has been featured quite widely in the media. The Ocean Bird concept was developed by our sister company, Villainous Marine. Um, for the deep sea vehicle carrier segment, it will be the Orcel Wind. Uh, if it is uh, to come to market, it will be a Villainous, uh, on board a Villainous films and vessel. The objective here, is to achieve a drastic reduction in emissions. We're estimating up to 90% uh, relative to the best vessels in our fleet today. So it will take us close to, to zero emissions. We will still need to have a supplementary power system because of course the wind doesn't always blow in the speed and the direction that you would like it to. You will still need to be able to maneuver in port and so on. So we will have a supplementary system 
what the nature of that system uh, will be yet hasn't uh, been finalized. We are certainly considering all of the, the different uh, options that are there. The wind propulsion part of it will uh, be, comes from four wing sails. So they're not actual sails in the cloth sense that has been conventional for the industry. Rather, these are uh, more like aircraft wings. They are telescopic. That's important because this vessel needs to be able to navigate under bridges. Um, the, the total height with the, the sails extended will be around 100 meters, um, but that will reduce down to 50 or 55 meters uh, to, to navigate under uh, bridges. The vessel is going to be certainly at the large end of the scale. It could even be the largest wind propelled vessel that's ever been built. Um, it will have a capacity in terms of cargo of around 7,000 cars, the largest vessels of its kind, uh, that, uh, the same kind today, they're closer to around eight or eight and a half thousand. So it's even at the big end of the scale. Total length around 220 meters and at 40 meters of beam, it'll be a bit wider than the, even the widest vessels of its type today. Clearly the wider it is, the more inherently stable it is and that helps um, because stability is uh, an important factor with uh, when we've got wing sails. Our ambition is to have proven the concept and to be ready to order the vessel by 2022. So that's uh, quite an aggressive time scale that we're working to. Um, and in uh, Roger, addition quick to... interruption. Roger, sorry. Yes. Could you switch on your camera so the audience can, can actually see that you're, you're not a machine? Okay. So that's good. Thank okay. You. Okay. Right. So, um, the ambition is to have the vessel ordered by 2022. Um, but between now and then, there are two major areas of activity. One is that we are we need to continue with the detailed design of the vessel. And the second is we need to conduct an extremely comprehensive evaluation. That really is the second part that a uh, topic that I want to talk about today. There are essentially five tests that we need to uh, subject the, the concept to. And you may actually say that these five tests hold true no matter what kind of future technology you're looking at for a vessel of any kind. And so just to summarize, to go through them quickly, does, does this make financial sense? Um, and that's an important question to answer today relative to uh, what we would, the vessel would compete against uh, or technology against now, but also what they will expect to uh, to be competing against in five years now. Um, and what's viable today isn't necessarily going to be the same thing. A good example of this uh, that came into effect globally on the 1st of January in 2020. If you had been trying to sell oil, the 0.5% sulfur product, two years ago, Today, that market is around 200 million tons a year. What created that? Well, a change in the regulation. So that's certainly an important factor to keep in mind when you're looking at these new kinds of technologies from the financial perspective. Then from the operational side, we need to be certain that this vessel is uh, going to be able to um, be deployed across a, a wide range of uh, globally deployable, because that's important in our business. That means that its ability to navigate under bridges, and I've explained a little on that earlier, is a is very important consideration. But also then, of course, it needs to um, to, to have a, um, a commercial uh, viability as well. And I think so there's an important question when it comes to wind, because of course, of the, the nature of wind is, isn't predictable. Um, and these vessels, it must be assumed, will compete against those which are uh, relying on fuels. Um, whether there are zero carbon fuels or carbon neutral fuels, you still have to assume that you will compete against them. And that's a, an important question. Now, as I did say, the, the vessel will have a supplementary energy source and that will help uh, close uh, the, the gap between the, the power available from the wind and what's actually needed for competition. On the technical side, there are, that question can manifest itself in very many different ways. Um, just to take one example for wind, it's the stability of the vessel. Is this going to be safe to operate in all conditions that we may expect it to face over a 30-year career? 
and it's a you know it's a that's a, a very fundamental requirement it's safety of crew first safety for the the vessel for the cargo for the environment it's a really comprehensive assessment and then on the regulatory side it may seem that well from the, any vessel that's wind powered is pretty safe from future regulatory development but don't forget, it's not just wind power. There will be a supplementary energy source. And uh, so that's a, you know, the developing regulatory environment is important to keep in, uh, in, in perspective too. So just to, to finish on this, all of these criteria need to be met for the, for, the, for the case to be viable for a specific vessel type, size, uh, and an area of deployment. Um, and so the, the answers to this assessment they will vary from one case to another. What may make sense for one type of vessel could be uh, proven not viable for another. Also, the answers uh, to the assessment will change over time as regulation develops, as other technologies uh, develop. Um, and I think with, with this framework, you set a very high bar, but it's important to do that. I think otherwise you risk... Um, you know, answering, finding out the answer to the question of what's the fastest way to become a millionaire in shipping? And, and the answer is, of course, start as a billionaire. So we're trying to avoid doing that. But it does mean that we, uh, we need to find these answers ourselves. We need to be cautious in our approach. We can't afford to be conservative. That's not going to get us where we need to be. So with that, I'll give the word back to Lars Robert. Thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you, Roger, and, and very good with 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 a bit of uh, common sense and uh, and a good uh, uh, you know uh, good way to, to think about what you're doing here. It's not just about uh, running out there and uh, and trying things out, which is also important. Things need to be tried, but actually to make this a massive part of the transition, it needs actually to be viable in in a in a commercial sense. I'd like to invite the uh, the whole panel. Uh, onto the screen. So if you can please switch on your cameras and uh, so forth, so we can uh, engage in a, in a little bit of Q&A and panel discussion. And and I think that this was really uh, helpful with, with a bit of uh, regulatory updates from uh, Bureau Veritas uh, with uh, two examples of what can be done and then the cautious element from a ship owner uh, to show that, yeah, it's all fine, but it, it, it needs to make sense. We cannot all uh, end up as millionaires. That's not good. They need to be billionaires in this industry, hopefully, I guess, uh, uh, still. Uh, so that was, that was a good one. So um, to start out, we have a few questions. And, and, and actually, a number of the questions, uh, Yarko, they, they are surrounding uh, your equipment. And, and I think it, it's about a bit of comparison here to, to normal sales in, in the sense. In how, do, how does these rotors actually compare to normal sales in, in, in terms of square meters and, and you know how, how can you compare maybe you can elaborate uh, quickly mm. on that thank you yeah uh, different profiles provide a different amount of um, lift and and also drag and, and and basically more lift you can provide then the smaller the sail can be to to uh, produce the same amount of forward thrust um, Flettner rotors are the are the best for for providing the uh, lift, and mm, mm, compared to a very very traditional square sail, they are up to, I think, six times more effective or even more. But but then if you have suction sails or, or or wing sails, they they are they are for sure better than the conventional sails. Thank you, Yarko. Um... Uh, really interesting, and it, it's you know when you see these rotor sails the first time, you start wondering you know, how on earth is this actually working? And then there are some pretty logical, you know, uh, aeronautical principles behind it uh, that you need to understand. And and, and then of course it, it all makes mm. sense. Um, but but uh, Vincent, maybe you can also elaborate a little bit. And I think that this has been you know, the kind of the the drawback or or the the, the, the hesitance to, uh, of acceptance to these kind of kite systems or, or, or air wings or how we, we, we call them, you know, how safe are they? How likely is it that they will actually drop in the ocean if you suddenly, you know, turn? There is a question about, a, a, you know, a collision avoidance and, you know, 
how how safe is it actually to have this thing flying around up there in in, in the air uh, in the end of a very long wire? I think you're muted, Vincent. Hi. Yeah, safety is really at the core of operations. We come from aeronautics where there are three rules uh, leading aeronautics. Everything is done in that sector. The first one is safety, the second one is safety, and the third one is safety, as they usually say. So um, it has drawn um, years of uh, uh, experience uh, being technology but also know how in how doing things how to develop an aircraft etc and that's the exact same uh, that we are have been transferring technology that we have been transferring and that we're applying in how we design the the kite this is this is in general but specifically uh, when collision avoidance uh, or men overboard procedures i mean this is all covered has been discussed of course with the bureau of veritas and, and class and k to um uh, the the in less than five seconds we are able to bring the kite above the head of the of the ship uh, so that uh, no traction is applied and the and the kite and the ship is free to maneuver as it in order to avoid the obstacle or, or get over uh, over uh, uh, a man. Uh, so this is it. And then uh, the is uh, um, is to w the way we ensure the safety and actually the reliability of the system is uh, through a specific um, approach to redundancy. Every um, all components uh, are able to bring. Uh, all functions are able to bring a 10 minus 8 to, sorry, a 10 minus 8 uh, probability of failure, which is uh, once every 30 years only. So once in the lifetime of the ship, uh, one could uh, expect uh, a failure. Uh, and to that, uh, of course, we choose the components, but also we make them redundant whenever their characteristics are not sufficient. I hope uh, that answers the question. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, certainly, it, it, it does. Um, uh, there are, there are a, a few more questions. There's also one for Mr. Arai. Could you expand a little about your operational experience of trialing the sea wing uh, on board one of your vessels? Uh, <laughs> did, uh, or have you actually done it yet, or is it planning to do so? Maybe we are planning to do it very soon. Yeah. Uh, uh, Vincent has put it on one of their ships, uh, and uh, we're still waiting for for it to become available for our big ships. Okay. Th thank you. So, so, so we will have to to wait and see, so to speak. And I think mm -hmm. there there are a lot of uh, these projects, and and Gavin alluded to that. There are a multitude of projects, uh, you know, being launched in the next few years, and and I think we will get, have a lot more experience very soon. Um, or um, there is also a question about uh, IACs and and how the different classification societies see these. Uh, uh, guidelines for uh, for wind assisted propulsion in relation to the edi calculation do, do you see do you see some uh, um what you say uh, agreement attraction to, to to develop to go in the same direction or or, or how, how do you foresee the the deliberation to go at imo on this uh, for now the different members of the iax um develop their own or on uh, rules and um, because it's a it's first step and uh, we need to have a first uh, first uh, first base of documentation of standards and uh, guidance notes uh, to to bring uh, to together but uh, we we discuss between us and uh, IX members um, I think that uh, at the second, uh, a second step uh, will to to have a, a common uh, common discussion and to, to align, uh, have an agreement uh, about the wind propulsion consideration. Thank you, Ord. And 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 maybe Roger, how how far away do you see the 
what you say the the major breakthrough of wind assisted propulsion in 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 in, in shipping uh, in in more general shipping so to speak one thing is all the the fantastic projects but as you said you know this have to make sense from a commercial uh, operational technical uh, uh, financial perspective and i mean and when when that takes place you know it becomes a the norm rather than the uh, than the the odd mm -hmm. thing so please uh, if you could uh, elaborate a bit it, I, I would love to be able to give you a, a very clear four-digit number for the year that that will take place when the, you know, the, we reach that tipping point. But the reality is that this is going to be, this is a complex uh, situation which is governed by many, many different factors, including regulatory development is probably, a, you know, so this is one of the biggest of them. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people will appreciate that while we know that there are big things that are coming down the, the re regulatory pipe, uh, pipeline, it's kind of difficult to know at this stage exactly when they're going to take effect and what the degree of impact that they will have. Um, I would expect, though, that the, 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 certainly the, the best days of, of wind propulsion are still ahead of it. Um, and I would say that there would be a, um, a, a large uptake in wind propulsion systems through the end, uh, before the end of this decade. Thank you very much, and I think that's that's uh, some uh, very clear vision for the future. And unfortunately, we we are actually running out of time today. Um, we we could probably continue this this uh, discussion and and uh, Q and A for for a while, but uh, we are bound by uh, some time lines here, and and I will have to to wrap this off up. And so first of all, I would like to to thank uh, each of you for your presentations. Uh, very. Uh, a lot of uh, very good information uh, that the audience can take away. Maybe Vincent, because w when you were doing your presentation, I actually experienced quite a bit of uh, uh, fallout in your sound. So maybe if it was possible, you could elaborate a little bit of what you said on your slides so we could uh, make them available to the audience afterwards, because it's, it was uh, actually a pity that, that we missed some of the technical details there in your presentation. Um, so um, with that, uh, uh, as I said, thank you very much. Um, we are going to hear a lot more in, in the future about wind assisted propulsion. Uh, I would like to thank the sponsor once again, uh, SKV Seafir, uh, uh, for for their support for the uh, for today's uh, uh, event. Uh, I would also like to remind you all uh, uh, that uh, come November the second uh, to the fourth in Hamburg, the uh, regular, I think, uh, now uh, one year postponed uh, propulsion and future fuel conference will uh, will kick off. Hopefully, uh, I have the uh, the pleasure once again to to be uh, co-chair of the conference, and I would like to see uh, all of you, uh, the speakers, the audience, uh, to the conference. Uh, it will be lovely to actually engage, uh, you know, in real life with people rather than than doing it on the screen all the time, which we have become so used to. Uh, venue is still to be confirmed, I understand, but uh, uh, it's it's definitely in Hamburg. So uh, with that, I'll. Uh, I'd like to thank you all and hand you back to Gavin, who will close the session for today. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you again to all the panelists and, and a special thank you to, uh, to Robert um, for um, moderating and keeping us all in check, uh, which was excellent. Um, yeah, and I, I, I reiterate, I hope, I hope in November that we'll all be uh, shaking hands and maybe uh, having having a beer or two as well uh, to to celebrate the 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 successful conference um, and uh, finally uh, it just leaves it to me to say uh, I, I've really enjoyed not being the expert in the room um, hearing a lot of experts uh, giving their giving their impressions giving their uh, overview. Of I, I, I'm looking forward to the developments over the next 12 months and even the developments up until November. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of fresh news and, and, and fresh uh, installations that we'll be talking about. So uh, once again, thank you very much. And thank you to the webinar um, uh, sponsor, SKV Zephyr Group. And I will see you in November. Thank you.